Welcome, everybody, to another edition of uh, the Naturally Bay Area Quick Bites. Um, today's session is on influence and marketing, and I'm particularly excited. I'm an old school marketer, um, and I see influence and marketing as an evolution of that uh, that old and sometimes controversial subliminal marketing that you used to hear about. Remember the old days when uh, Coca-Cola would throw a, a slide of a refreshing Coke into the credits of a movie they couldn't see it, but it was subconsciously working on you and make you get up and, and buy a Coke. Um, I think about influencer marketing as the modern day version of subliminal marketing, maybe more on the up and up. Um, importantly though, influencer marketing um, really needs to be a conscious part, and I say that deliberately, of every brand's marketing mix. Um, and today I'm, I'm really excited that we've got some experts in the room that are going to pass on some of their tips and tricks on, um, you know, how this growing practice can become an important part of your marketing mix. Um, before I introduce the panelists, just a quick reminder, if you have questions, we want to make this an interactive session. We'll probably go about 30 minutes of the panelists talking, and then we'll save the last 15 minutes um, for Q&A. Please submit your questions into the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, and feel free to insert them at any point. And, and if it makes sense, we actually may pull them up during the, uh, the, the first 30 minutes, but we'll try to get to as many of these as we can throughout the session. So without further ado, I'm, I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves. Um, and uh, Jesse, why don't I start with you and, and you can lead off and, and say hello to the team. Hi everyone, I'm Jesse Ferrioli. I'm the Director of Marketing at Mazetta. For those of you who might not be familiar with Mazetta, we're a small family-owned company specializing in olives, peppers, and pasta sauce. Prior to my time at Mazetta, I worked for the Hershey Company. So I worked on the Hershey's brand, Reese's brand, as well as Crave Jerky, uh, which Hershey had acquired at that time. And uh, today I work at Mazetta and I use influencer marketing uh, really heavily, actually. Um, in particular, I use it as a content creation system for me, as well as a way to educate and inspire consumers on products that to some degree require a little more education and inspiration than maybe some other products out there. Hi, I'm Karnika Haridas. Um, I'm the marketing manager at La Tourangel. We're also a small family owned and operated company of artisan oils and dressings. Uh, we're based here in Berkeley and in Woodland, California is where all of our production and our uh, artisan nut mill is. We do have a French um, operation in, in, in France um, that produces for uh, that region. Um, my, I've worked here and then with another small uh, with some small brands at O'Neill Vintners prior to this, but my primary um, experience prior to that was in performance media agencies, um, search, paid search, social, and things like that. Um, so I, I definitely have a performance view of, of influencer marketing, but um, to, to Jesse's point, you know, content creation is really difficult when you're working in small brands and environments, and influencer marketing has been um, the go-to for, for so many different um, objectives. So, you know, creating awareness, reaching, you know, hyper-targeted audiences, product education, driving trial or driving to retail, definitely content creation. And we use it, you know, ongoing on a, on a, at some level always, you know, brand ambassadors or, you know, one or two key partners, um, but also during pulse periods for product launches, um, key periods, driving to retail and things like that. Um, it's one of the more fun and dynamic parts of uh, the role. Great, thank you, Kanika. Drew. Hello, everybody. I'm Drew McGowan, coming to you from beautiful Oakland, California. Um, I have led influencer marketing and communications at Cliff Bar and Company for the last four years. Um, I'll actually be moving on from Cliff Bar at the end of this week, and I'll be focusing on my consulting business helping and coaching brands and companies to strategically, effectively, and efficiently reach their goals uh, using influencer marketing and communications. Um, it's an evolving space, and there's stuff to learn every day. Um, I'm proud to be a part of uh, the board of the Influencer Marketing Association as well, and really excited to be here and um, dive into this conversation. <laughs> 
Great. Well, thank you, all, and uh, and thank you on behalf of all of Naturally Bay Area and the folks on this call. Appreciate you taking the time to pass on your expertise. And maybe the, the best place to start, um, Drew, maybe you could just sort of give us a brief outline of what influencer marketing is today and sort of the the, the platform upon which it, it sits, if you will. Uh, by that, I don't mean the platform we talked about la earlier. I mean the broader platform. Of course. And I'll, I'll just I'll just caveat that and say this is this is my opinion. Um, it is if you talk to 10 different people, you might get 10 different answers in this. But this is how I at least like to think about it is. So I started my career in public relations and public relations, you know, once upon a time was you had a, a story about a brand or a product or something you were doing and you, and you pitched a story to a newspaper like The New York Times. And you kind of hoped that they would write about it in a positive way and that lots of people would see your product, for instance, and maybe buy it. Um, and I think of influencer marketing as the same way and as a much more targeted, much more efficient and effective way to reach an audience. So if you think about it is I think a lot of people, there's kind of a maybe a, a bit of a a bad name for influencer marketing because too many people, especially in the business world, um, need to be properly educated about what influencer marketing can do for a brand or a company. And I think too many people think of it, especially senior leaders at companies, think of it as, well, we pay the Kardashians to plug our product. And yes, that is a minute part and not very strategic part of influencer marketing, um, but that is part of it. And, but I think there are ways that you can drive awareness, conversion, um, as Jesse said before, educate, inspire, um, create content. Um, and think of it as like you are borrowing people's audience, people that they actually really trust, they count on. Um, and in, in our way, the other the way I like to think about it is as well as all of us are influencers in some way. We may not have huge social media followings. I think we've gotten away from thinking of influencers as they have millions of followers. All of us are influential in some way. Like for myself, I'm influential um, in the barbecue world. And I don't have a huge social media audience, but I know a lot of people come to me for tips and advice around barbecue. And we all have different things we can do. What we're trying to do is leverage people that are influential to an audience that are trusted that are authentic to that audience and, and hopefully pair them with a brand or a product or a company that they wanna talk about it to their audience. And in some ways that one post or those couple of posts will actually get more impressions and more engagement than that article I mentioned at the beginning that would run in the New York Times. Got it, great. Well, so let's build on that a little bit um, because a part of what you started to talk about was paid versus organic influencers, right? Would someone on the panel like to just chat a little bit about the difference in those two? And, and I know there's a range in between. I can do it quick. I think that, you know, folks that are influencers and that word is, like you said, it's kind of become maybe potentially a bad word, but, um, but it's folks with some influence. They have an audience, they have content, they maybe have an area of interest or, or, or expertise, right? And so, um, and we all know content is really hard to come by sometimes, but they're looking to um, give value to their audience, have, you know, engage with their audience, provide something. So um, they may find, you know, if we're in food, so um, they may find, that there may be a recipe developer, they may find a product that they really love using in the kitchen. And so they're going to talk about it. And that would be, you know, sort of an organic hit, right, to use a PR term. And then a paid one would be sort of like a sponsor or an ambassador in which you say, hey, um, we're going to give you some product, we may pay you some money, and uh, we'd like you to help us promote our brand or product or, you know, a way to utilize the, the, the product. And, um, and there's different ways to go about this. There's, you know, a wide net of folks, you know, so a larger campaign of smaller influencers with small bubbles in different places, or you can go the big route, which is sort of the traditional um, celebrity uh, endorsement sponsor um, brand ambassador route. So um, it, it kind of runs the gamut, I'd say, the full gamut. Okay, and Jesse, did you want to add to that in, in terms of your experience? What, what type of influences have you used? 
Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so we've um, we've used mostly paid, um, but we've done again run the gamut from micro all the way up to celeb. So um, there's different price ranges across all of those. Um, they, as you might imagine, they do vary greatly. Uh, so similar, Carnegie did a really great overview of kind of what that paid versus not can look like. Um, but there's a lot of influence, and I think Drew brought this up in terms of people have influence. Um, without it being even necessarily paid and like sponsoring the ad uh, where we do a lot of product seeding with people who we know are influ influential. So we're not necessarily asking for um, a piece of content, but we're sending out new innovation and asking them to try it because we know that there are people who um, already like our products and also have some sort of fear, sphere of influence within our target consumer. Well, maybe, maybe, um, do you could expand a little bit on this? Like I, I've heard terms like nanos and micros and mids and micros and macros. And can you talk a little bit about the types of influences that are out there in terms of size and influence? Sure. Um, so I think, again, going back to what I said at the beginning, I think a lot of people think of them uh, as influencers, right or wrong, as celebrities. And that's true. Um, over the course of my career, and certainly at Cliff Bar, I've worked with celebrities, and those could be um, kind of pop culture icons. They could also be athletes, musicians, chefs, um, runs the gamut. Um, and then kind of as you go down from a, a size perspective, and that's usually the terms is the size of their audience. Mm -hmm. um, the celebrities, you know, are reaching a million, four million, 10 million people with a post. That doesn't mean, keep that in mind, that doesn't mean that everybody is seeing, that whole audience is seeing that post. So the only way, obviously, all these um, social media companies have, have figured out a way to use influencers to make money for themselves. And so just like you know, Facebook, Instagram, um, any of the platforms limit how many people uh, in their audience are actually seeing a post, unless, of course, you pay for more people to see that. And so you can boost posts. Um, but that becomes, you know, think of it as the celebrity influencer is going to be the most expensive to do that post. Um, and then you're going to have to, to get the real numbers, you're going to actually have to pay to boost to get a lot more people to see the post. I've found that working with micro influencers for our needs as a company and um, is much more effective. They're going to be a lot less expensive. And the engagement rate, which is, you know, we can talk about measurement too, but engagement rate is something that um, I have found as the most effective way to really measure um, how well your campaign is doing. So engagement rate is how many people are engaging with a post. That could be a like, it could be a comment, it could be a share, um, it could be a post to their website, et cetera. And those are the really, that's when people kind of care, they have some skin in the game versus, um, versus just maybe an audience seeing a post and not doing anything with it. Um, so micro, I think it can be really effective and, like I said, really uh, efficient as well. So, so how does a brand begin to uh, play out their strategy or, or tactics around who to choose to be their influencers? If, if you, and I'm not sure you always get to choose, by the way, but how, how should a brand think about it? What, what, in your experience, what have you guys seen as the best way to approach this? I can start with that one. So um, first for me, it starts with the target consumer that I want to reach. Um, so really understanding who they are. So let's say I'm trying to go after millennial moms. Um, that's probably going to change who I'm going to look at in terms of influencers and where do millennial moms get their advice. And usually it's other moms. Um, so uh, we use an agency at Mazetta which helps us kind of comb through um, based on certain attributes that we're looking for for our influencers. And that helps us, it aggregates everything, right? Like from their following to their, you know, their key um, attributes, et cetera. And that really helps us sort through, okay, who are people who are probably gonna be really influential amongst this target audience that I'm going after? Um, and then once we go there, we start to look at, okay, well, what 
what do their platforms look like? Does that content feel on brand to us? Some of the, you know, um, I'm doing a balance of what does their content look like? Cause I'm always looking at, can I repurpose this content later and, and really get a lot out of this influencer? And also do they feel like they would represent the brand in a, in a, in a great way? Uh, so those are the, some of the key things um, that I look for when I'm starting to develop, okay, I've got this influencer campaign. This is the consumer I'm trying to reach. And then what are the considerations around, you know, fit for the brand as well. Got it. And Kanika, is that similar to the experience you've had? Do you use a different approach? Um, all of that is definitely relevant and comes into play. For me, I definitely start a little bit um, with the why, like what am I trying to achieve? Because sometimes if it is driving to retail and getting people to realize, hey, you know, then I might go to a smaller, or I would go always go probably to a smaller at this point in time agency, but to, to be able to get you know, maybe 50 or 100 in a particular market in, in a micro and say, you know, I want you to tag the store that it's in. I want you, you know, I want it to just be visible versus if I'm trying to um, create awareness um, around a particular product and how to use it. So our products require cooking for the most part. And so it's not just ready to eat really unless you're drizzling over something. And so, you know, I'm really looking for some quality, like, recipes and recipe developers, for example. Um, and then that might, you know, that that will sort of start to drive who who I would, you know, approach and go for. So if it's if it's a, if it's just a one off and, and trying to develop a couple of different recipes, um, then I, I'd go to folks that have consistently tagged us and are clearly know how to use our product and um, can convey that and have a following that, you know, that um, that, that really likes their method of, of cooking and, and their approach to food, which is, you can't just make that up overnight. Uh, you know, when I worked with the, with the wine brand, it's so easy to hold up a bottle of wine and, uh, you know, put, you know, in an occasion. So um, it's a little bit different. So we're looking for people that are, you know, here's, the, here's where you want quality, right? So what equals quality would be authenticity or, or um, you know, engagement with their audience and they've cultivated that. So that, that takes some doing and it's going to, cost more for that value than you know somebody saying hey this is a really cool thing that cool product that i've um that i've tried and i liked and, and go get it at whole foods down you know in in in, in our town so um starting with the, with sort of what am i trying to achieve uh helps me to start to go down the path of of you know how am i you know which door am i going to open to get there um yeah i'll, I'll just chime in quick so I think both Karnik and, and Jesse both said it well. I think it's it's making sure you're starting at a strategy level. This shouldn't just be like a tactic that you throw against a wall. It can be, and I think that happens too often. I think what's really critical is having influencer marketing have a seat at the table in your marketing mix. It should be thought of as a, a, just another way that you can reach an audience whether it, you know, it's, it, it helps with a media plan or it helps with your PR campaign or it helps with your, your shopper uh, programs, it can help with all those things. And you just need to be smart about how you use it. It can be a very efficient tool, but it's much more effective if it's part of the marketing mix and it's not just a standalone type of thing that you're doing. And um, you know, I think uh, Karnika was, was saying something I'd really love to chime in. We've talked a lot about kind of paid influencers even the micro, which you know, you're not spending that much on, it would be product and maybe a hundred, two hundred dollar gift card to get them to post. I think too many companies, especially smaller companies, don't keep in mind um, that you have fans that are posting and tagging you. Make sure you're taking advantage of those people and leveraging that. I don't mean taking advantage of them in a bad way, but reach out to them. They're fans of your product. And if they're tagging you, they care about you bring them in, like ask them, send them some free product, ask them to do some things for you. And again, they may not have a huge reach, but they are going to be influential within their, their community in, in whatever way they are. And I think that can be really effective. The other way is, is employees. Um, that's another way to do that smart and to make sure that um, employees are talking about something that they're proud of at the company or a new product they worked on um, you want to make sure they're being transparent, that they are employees of that company, that they're not hiding it, that they're just a fan of the company, because um, you do want to make sure you're above board, um, making sure that you're being transparent about working with influencers, whether they be employees or celebrities. 
That's great. That's great advice. Well, and, and let me ask, um, just build on that a little bit. What are some of the ways that you all have used to uh, engage your influencers, as you said, to get them to try your products and use your products? Um, maybe Jesse, do you, do you have some thoughts on that? Sure. So um, I guess kind of to piggyback off of what you were saying about leveraging your um, people who are already tagging you and stuff. One of the ways um, we find that is really effective is to well, we reach out to them and seed them with product. So when we have new innovation launches, we already know this is an audience of people who like our types of products or are very big fanatics who are probably going to talk about our products some more. Um, so that's one way that we kind of start to engage with these influencers and start that relationship and we kind of it's kind of built a sort of it's called it embedded brand ambassadorship program because you start to you know build relationships with these people over time who you know you already know they're really open to that kind of relationship with you and then the other piece is the agency um, and you have options there that I know we, we we discussed as a smaller group earlier around um, you know you can have a full-on agency managing it helping you find these influencers and reach out to them and, or you can choose a platform that gives you visibility and then you reach out, which I don't have as much experience with. And um, it sounds like Karnika and, and Drew, you have more experience with that end. But today um, I lean heavily on an agency to help with that initial outreach and negotiation. And then we start to work together once we get to the content creation phase. Great. And, and Kanika, do you want to build on that a little bit? In fact, there's some questions coming in about, you know, what agencies do you use to help manage influencers? Um, and, and I think, as you mentioned, Jesse, there's also platforms. So maybe you guys could talk a little bit about the difference of, of, of those two. Um, Kanika, do you want to talk a little about your, the agencies you use today? Or agencies? Um, sure. I, I have, you know, haven't used too many agencies. There are smaller um, agents, you know, that may, may manage a roster of you know, anywhere between like a dozen to 50 or something like that, uh, different influencers. Um, the, the very large, there are some platforms. So a couple of years ago, I used a platform called Popular Pays. This is a self-serve. I did have folks to, to, you know, help with the briefing process and some of the selection, but um, I, you know, each campaign I did was maybe 35 to 60, uh, you know, at a time and the campaign might be four or six week period. And, um, and I selected them, I spent hours and hours and hours because what, what we're looking for, all these things, authenticity, you know, like how do they present brands? Cause they're, they're going to be representing you at some point. So even if the, in, the investment is small, but, you know, uh, to do a little with a lot, you're trying to, to make it all count, right? Um, so that was one. Um, more recently, I used um, Statusphere to help with um, targeting. This was the retail one. So um, different. Uh, I had a couple of different regions, and I had a store list, and um, and that was very helpful um, to to be able to get product out and to be able to you know give a unified message about you know what are the product qualities and things like that, and to have um, all the local stores that do carry our product be tagged. And that was more uh, supporting shopper. Um, so those were two um, that I have, you know, more direct experience with. Um, none were really large platforms. Um, we, just now we were talking about how to, ways to engage with influencers. So um, just building one more thing on top of what Jesse mentioned, uh, like we do ambassador mailings as well, and they're very effective. Um, and then there's the one-on-ones, the um, you know, that, that you build relationship with. But I think one of the things that have been really effective for us, um, and this has happened, you know, this across not just where I'm working, but in previous uh, roles as well, is, is wrapping it in media. So working with a publisher um, um, that have a network of influencers, maybe they're, um, and, and being able to add to that. So there's content, there's uh, influencers as part of it, and then there's um, paid media to boost that content as well on top of that and that, that you know it's it's a it's a really great way to 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 leverage and to get more out of um each each single you know media on its own or influencers on their own too great um and Drew, do you want to talk a little bit more about platforms yeah yeah ahead. so uh, one thing to keep in mind jim is is just you know, think about it again, go back to your marketing mix. This might be kind of a newer part of your marketing mix or something you haven't even tried yet, but whether you go with an agency or a software or a platform, think of it as 
what do you do for media, buying media? What do you do for PR? What do you do for shopper marketing? You know, you can, there's lots of ways to do that. It's the same idea, right? So you, in some cases you get what you pay for, um, but you can do it in-house, you could hire an agency, or you could do kind of a combination of hiring people in-house to do it, working with consultants, working with a platform. Um, but what I would, what I would urge everyone to do is just get started. Um, there's no reason, even without a lot of you know budget, to, that you couldn't start doing these things. Ambassador mailings, figure out who's liking you on social media, who's posting about you, who's using your food or your product in a way that's unique. Um, those are all things technically that are free besides the, the postage or the product cost. So those are things you should be jumping in and trying and seeing what's working. Um, but you know, from a from a platform perspective, you know, there's great platforms out there. There's companies like Linkia. There's Maverick. There's uh, Influential. There are different companies that I've talked to or worked with over the years. Um, and it's it varies in what they offer. Just like any other, again, going back to those other parts of the marketing mix, all these different companies are going to offer different things. Go out, talk to them. Um, and figure out what is going to be useful for what you need right now, what you're trying to achieve. Always go back to that strategy and your goals and figure out how can influencer marketing play a role in that marketing mix. Great. That's really helpful. Um, by the way, you may hear my dog lapping in the background, so I apologize. Um, she needs to drink. The... Um, uh, so there's, there's some questions. I'm going to hit some of the questions because they're related to what you just talked about. Um, there's a lot of questions around cost, like how do you think about cost and ROI, which you, you can't have a marketing conversation without ROI. Any um, sort of guidance to, to the, the folks out there about how to think about, you know, calculating ROI on this? Uh, and again, I know that's a that's a tough question. So I, I throw that to any of you. If, if, um... Yeah, I'll ju I'll jump in quick. Again, I'll go back to this is this is new for a lot of people, but it's it's a t it's a tactic in your marketing mix. So how are you measuring ROI in other ways? How are you measuring media? How are you measuring PR? More traditional outlets. There are, like I said before, there's impressions. There's engagement. Um, Again, like I think it's just getting people started um, because the longer you wait to kind of perfect everything, the more likely that that platform, you know, that social media platform that you're going to work with is no longer what you want to work with anymore because things are constantly evolving. If you think during the pandemic, uh, Twitch was hugely popular with gamers um, and that audience, but Twitch found a, a great role to play in the music business and live events and has totally changed. They're still uber popular with gamers, but that now they're reaching all different types of audiences. And so if you had kind of waited, um, you know, in the last month or so, two months, Clubhouse has come up um, and that's already kind of gone and like skyrocketed and gone down quite a bit. So we'll see what happens with that. But then there's also, you know, TikTok, the rise of TikTok during the, the pandemic and people being at home and wanting to do that. I'd say just jump in, try things, and you'd be surprised on how you can evolve pretty quickly. Okay. And I would add to that. There's there's different, there's like other kinds of value that you have to kind of bring into the equation, right? So content creation is one of them. So knowing in my situation, you know, I had no way of creating, our social media was essentially dark when we started this. And this was the way to start turning on our social media for our brand was to get this content from influencers. So there's a, you know, that's, huge photo shoot budgets, right, that um, are now gone in terms of I didn't need to go do a bunch of shoots to get content to have regular posting. I used influencers to be able to suddenly go from dark social media to posting five times a week, um, which, you know, that's a, that's a big difference. And um, so there's that value that it brings. And then there's also, you know, if you have the influencers driving to your website, you can look at traffic or, um, you know, if you're a, more of a direct to consumer business, which Mazetta isn't, but if, you know, if we were, um, you know, you could track some of that as well as part of your, you know, um, way to kind of understand the value that it's bringing you. Right. Sort of a related question that's in the question feed was uh, if you're a new brand, 
how do you think about um, what kind of budget you need to get started? And I assume by that, they mean like, you know, if, if I wanted to get going, what's, what's sort of the baseline of what I need to actually have some sort of effect? And, um, um, maybe Drew, you could throw a thought. Uh, I know that's a hard question. It depends. It's, on it's hard not knowing more about what that person or brand is trying to accomplish and what they do, but just generally, um, again, you get what you pay for um, and you can start really small and, you know, you can have somebody in house being doing something or work with a small boutique agency or one of these software platforms. Um, but it is going to take some, some people hours for sure. Um, and then, you know, to, to work with a micro influencer and it can, it can range, it can be every, everything from just sending them products. Um, and that's, that's harder um, to get people to to ju to post um, on your behalf if it's just product, unless it's a high end product, right? It's a beauty product or new sneakers or it's a guitar or something like that that's has value. You have to realize this is somebody's. Um, it could be their side hustle. It could be their kind of full time job, and you need to respect the creator that is creating content for you or posting ratings and reviews for you. Their time's worth something. Don't just try to kind of screw them over and get something for free out of them. Um, respect them, respect them as a partner in your marketing, and you'll you'll be surprised what they can do for you. But like a, a standard, you know, um, a post, for instance, to somebody that has like 10 to 20,000 followers, we were typically paying, you know, 200, $250 plus some product to get them to post. Um, and then, you know, the platform that we were using um, to Jesse's point, we then could use that content on our website in in media at field events. And it, I mean, it kind of pays for itself, which is pretty amazing and not having to do photo shoots and all the rights be, behind like the photographer on that photo shoot too. Um, it's, it's pretty beneficial. And the other thing that we used really effectively is ratings and reviews um, as a way to really convert people. We all know how valuable ratings are when you go and buy a product. If you can get, you know, 50 uh, decent reviews, um, that can really help, especially a new product or a new brand get out there. Um, so those are just some ways. That's an interesting point, do that you raise, which is um, in a lot of ways, those ratings, the star ratings are a form of influence, right? Um, I certainly use it when I go to buy a product, a four and a half star product. I'm influenced by that. Right, so uh, that's a really good point that you raise. Uh, there's a, there's also a question in here around. Um, so while we're on the the, the idea of um, of cost, there's a there's an interesting question. Can you over the price ranges of working with influencers from the, the different levels, micro, mid, and celeb? And I think you've touched on the micro and the, and the mid. What about celebs? How do we think about the the big celebs and and whether or not a brand should even pursue going going big? What I don't know if, how much experience any of you have had with that, but any thoughts for for the folks on the call about how to evaluate the whether to go big? I don't know, Drew, uh, if you've had this. Um, I I'm in the throes of working through a, with a celeb right now, so I can kind of give an idea. Um, so I'm we're talking people who have two million plus followers, um, and their range um, and you know, it's ranging and it really depends because this is where you start to talk more than just a post. You're talking like more like partnership level I've found. Um, so if it's just a one-off post and they're kind of in that high end, you're probably talking around the 50K for just one post. But when you start to talk about more of a long-term relationship, which I think is what you should think about when you're talking about a celebrity, it's not like a one-off one -off post, it's just like a one-time hit. It, and they know that it says sponsored and, you know, it's, it's like, it, I don't know that it does that much for you, but that long-term relationship with someone that's very authentic to your brand could really pay off for you. And that's what we're working on at Mazetta. And that type of stuff can go, you know, for a year long partnership up into like the 250 K mark really depends on their following again, because there's a big range between 2 million and 7 million, for example. But, um, you know, that, but there's a lot of other things that can come along with that. That's not just a post that's more regular posting stories, content giveaways, um, 
you know, sweepstakes, those kinds of things that they can be involved in that you can leverage out of that partnership. So it's really hard to give an exact figure, but it just to kind of give a range of from one post to a bigger partnership, you're, you're kind of talking in that range. And I think it's, it's thinking about it too. If, you know, you were going to hire a celebrity spokesperson, mm -hmm. what, what do you want them to do for you? Is, is it, are they going to be part of a media campaign? Are they going to do a PR event for you? Or are they just doing a one-off post? I would, I would stay away from the one-off post. I don't think that's going to be worth your, the ROA's eye is probably not going to pay off unless it's just a pure awareness play. Um, but if you can do something where you can find somebody that is a celebrity or has a, a huge number of followers that has already talked about you or your product or the, the industry you're in or cares about something or I think honestly, a cause that's that's near and dear to them, that's the way to go in. And that's the same way I would think about it if I was going to hire somebody to be a PR spokesperson is they want, you want them to be authentic. You, it, everybody's smart enough to know who's just a paid spokesperson and who's just collecting a check. Nobody wants that for their brand. Um, you know, at, at Cliff during the, um, during the pandemic, we worked a lot with uh, Steph and Aisha Curry's foundation, Eat, Learn, Play Foundation. And we got uh, staff, you know, to do some different things with us that if we just went through kind of the, 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 the you know, through the sports agent side would be millions of dollars to work with him. And because we were supporting his nonprofit and the posts were about that relationship, not about that he eats cliff bars, for instance, it was about the relationship with feeding kids in Oakland, then that be, was very authentic and they were happy to do that. And that was just a way, a smart way. I, you know, I think using cause um, is something I've done throughout my career. And I think that's really critical, especially if it's something very true to your company or your brand that you really care about. Don't just create a cause to be a part of marketing. Um, hopefully it's something that you really stand behind and support for years. Great, that's helpful. Um, and Kanika, maybe I'll throw this one your way. There's a question here about, um, you know, the importance of being hands-on with your marketing, with your influencers, but has anyone had experience, good or bad, with uh, using turnkey platforms, uh, you know, to, to try to use it, an approach that gets to folks that you may not have a direct relationship with? Um, I know you mentioned you work with a lot of smaller influencers. Do you go through a platform to do that? And do you have any uh, experience that you could share? Yeah, actually, I probably am not the best person on the panel to answer this question, but the smaller ones, yeah, I mean, it, the more control you have, the, the higher quality you can personally ensure. Um, however, it does take a lot of time and effort. Um, and that's where, you know, an agency that just like any agency, if they understand your brand, if they, you know, are able to um, give the right attention and have the right folks on, then um, I think you're going to have a much better experience with, with, you know, the deliverable overall and, and therefore the results, um, you know, folks that have, um, that know their influencer and know how they work are going to be much more efficient with their own time and delivering what you need as well. And so, um, this is a, this is totally a relationships, um, channel. Okay. So this notion of turnkey, um, influencer marketing may be a misnomer. How would, how would you react to that, Drew? I know you talked a little bit about platforms earlier. Did the platforms, are they, do they give you permission to be more turnkey? For, for me, it did. Um, I don't know, Drew, if, what your experience was, but I, when I started, we had a really, really lean team at Mazetta. And so I knew I didn't have someone that could kind of comb through, find these people, negotiate the contracts. Um, I really needed to turn it on and, and, and quickly so that we, you know, we were able, like I said, to also turn on our social media at the same time and start that, um, you know, the, all the different parts of our marketing mix. This was really key to getting it kicked off. So I did work with um, an agency knowing that I needed that resource uh, to really get us started. And it was really pretty turnkey because they have, you know, um, the, it's a full platform with that's fully searchable that also gives you real time um, data on how everything is performing and, and where we are in the contracting process. So um, it's also where they submit their content, we approve it, make comments, ask for changes, etc. So for me, I was able to go from like, 
you know, basically nothing to having a full influ influencer program in a month. Um, so there, there is that option and it, it worked really well for me. And then over time, we'll see, you know, um, at the time it was like, okay, we're all about content, content, content. We need to get that started. Um, cause we had a couple different goals, um, strategically, but now it's really turning into educate and inspire and educate and inspire requires also a lot more. Um, I think, you know, Karnika talked about this earlier, just coming through of understanding, do these people have credibility in the foodie space and, and, you know, are they going to create really great, um, you know, recipes for us that are inspirational, that do educate people on how to use our products. Um, but we have a, a lot of um, ability to review and approve or not approve influencers through the platform. So it really makes things turnkey for us. Um, because otherwise it would require a lot of man hours. And I, at the time when I kicked this off, I didn't have the team to do that. Great. Yeah. I think, I think that, that, says it really well. I think if you have a lean team, um, this is, it's a way to throw money at a problem, um, a platform that you can um, reach a lot of influencers really efficiently. Um, and it goes back to what I said at the very beginning. It, you think of it as kind of an ad buy is when, you, when, you, when you're buying uh, media, you're thinking about who's your target, what are they reading, what are they viewing, depending on you know, what you're trying to achieve. Same thing with influencers, the platform that we worked with, um, you know, you write a brief about what you're trying to accomplish, who you, and that in that brief would be just like anything else when you're writing a marketing or creative brief. It's what's your strategy? What are you trying to achieve? What are your goals? What are you offering? Um, and the platforms will help find those people. And then you can be as hands-on or not on, uh, you can just kind of believe the platform and most of those people will be pretty good or you can be much more hands-on, which is what we do, is actually checking who are the actual influencers we want in that specific campaign on that brief. And, but that takes, to Jesse's point, some more time, some human resources, um, but it was worth it for us. But that's something you need to decide and decide what to do in your own business. Terrific. Well, I think we've come up to the uh, to the end of the session. This is tremendous. Uh, I, I learned a lot personally, and I, I appreciate uh, the, the three of you taking the time to pass on your insights and learnings uh, to all of us. Um, very, very grateful for you taking the time. Um, I know this is a, an area we'll probably be back to because I, I think it continues to evolve um, over time. And it, but what is clear is it, it it should become an integral part of your marketing mix. So. Thank you again for helping us all out. Um, and so, uh, and I think uh, we have a LinkedIn for those members of NBA. Um, I think uh, Lizzie is going to publish our, our LinkedIn link. So, if you want to jump on there, we can potentially um, get some of these other questions answered uh, and hook you up with with uh, these folks if you've got other questions and thoughts. And I'll close with. Um, Beyond our thank you, on May 5th, mark your calendars. We have another Quick Bites. Uh, this is another powerful session. It's, it's the category review trends with top buyers. And we have buyers from Whole Foods, Safeway, and Good Eggs joining us uh, to pass on their thoughts about um, how you can get on their shelf. Um, so with that, I will say, again, thank you to all my panelists. You guys were terrific. And thanks to all of you on the call for joining us and hope to see you again soon.